Welcome to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, where faith and liberty meet. Our host is Dave Garrison from Ohio Christian University, a longtime Fortune 100 company top executive and a former U.S. congressional candidate from Texas. Our goal for the Faith and Liberty Talk Show is to give you an opportunity to listen to interviews and discussions with significant authorities and experts on subjects related to Christians engaging in the civil and political arena. The mission of the show is to give you real information and not sound bites that you can really use. We have a website for the show, faithandliberty.org. At this website, you can obtain more information about the show, our guests, subscribe to our newsletter, and become a friend of the show and like us on our Faith and Liberty Facebook page. You can also access all of our previous shows. Please keep in mind that the Faith and Liberty Talk Show exists only with the generosity and support of our listeners. If our show is of value to you, we would appreciate you visiting our website, faithandliberty.org, and donating to the show. Now, let's begin today's show. Thank you for joining us. Today we have with us Sam Sorbo. She's a published author and a success in a number of fields. She's been an international fashion model with one of the elite fashion model agencies. Was that out of Paris, Sam? I worked in Paris and New York and Milan. I based myself. I also had agencies in Hamburg and Munich and Japan. Are you glad you're out of that? industry? Interesting question. I'm I'm I was glad to leave it and I was glad to get back into it. So So you're you're still back in it in some form? I did a shoot uh well it's over a year ago now, but uh yeah, they called me and paid me a lot of money to go do a fashion shoot, so I did it. Well, that's part of the reason I brought it up because I I saw a photo and it looked like you were doing some more modeling and I think that's fantastic. Another thing that I've Listeners, I've noticed about uh, Sam is she was an exchange student in Sweden, and you attended Duke University to study, of all things, biomedical engineering. How how did that go for you? I loved it. Uh, It was interesting. I, I went to Sweden as a senior in high school. First best thing I ever did for myself, and I advocate for study abroad uh, when you when you leave the country and you get a chance to look at it from a foreign perspective, you see how great this country is. When I came back, I attended Duke, and I had learned a little bit about computers in Sweden, which I'd never been exposed to at my high school in the United States. And I noticed that I was taking all of these computer courses. When I went through the the syllabus, I realized that every course that was really, like, tempting me were in the biomedical field. So even though I attended Duke initially as a Trinity student, which is in the liberal arts, I moved over uh, fairly precipitously into the engineering realm, and I became a biomedical engineer. So uh, do you have a degree in biomedical engineering? Uh, I do not. Okay. Additionally, Sam is the mother of three and wife of actor Kevin Sorbo of Hercules fame, and his current movie is God is Not Dead. Do you get tired of being referred to as Kevin Sorbo's wife? Never. By the way, the movie's called God's Not Dead. What did I uh, say? You said God is not dead, and oh. I don't know. That's just a sticking point. It's God's Not Dead because I think the the emphasis is on, I don't know, anyway. Well, I have God's Not Dead as my wallpaper on my computer here in the studio, by the way. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Finished fourth for the weekend, $8.9 million gross. It's uh, doing phenomenally well in the theaters, and uh, the comments that I'm getting from people are amazing. And Kevin just forwarded me one that somebody wrote him and said, I'm so glad I know you because I really, really disliked your character. He really got me. He really (laughs) irked me, and I'm so glad I know you and know that that's not you. Well, yeah, I I watched the trailer. I I didn't try to get the access to it, uh, and I probably should have because I have heard some comments uh, and very excellent comments. So since we are talking about that, uh, Kevin is playing the role of an atheist professor. Yes. But what is the overall uh, premise of the movie? So this atheist philosophy professor starts the movie uh, by by beginning his class at the beginning of the school year uh, in a college. And he says to his students, you know what? God's dead. Let's not even have that debate. We can skip the first six weeks and get right to the heavy stuff, get right to the meat, because it's such a silly debate 
about the existence of God. Just write on your paper for me, God is dead. Sign your name, turn them in, and then we can move on into what I find to be, you know, the more meaningful philosophy. And he has one student who can't who says I can't write that. I I God is alive to me and uh and I believe that with my heart and I can't possibly sign a paper saying that I believe that God is dead. And so the professor says to him, "Fine. Then you will have the opportunity to defend your beliefs for the entire class and we will make a decision based on that and I'm going to enjoy failing you." <laughs> you know, I think I know that professor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I went to University of Texas in San Antonio and University of Houston and uh, University of Pittsburgh. And uh, that's where I ultimately graduated with my undergraduate. And I had a professor. Uh, I know this is off subject, but that's what we kind of do on this show. And I had this professor who walked in. He basically said, God is dead. And if you think he's not, you're going to have a lot of trouble in this um, class. And so I raised my hand. And you've heard the story, but I actually did it after I heard the story. And this is back in 88, I think it was. And I said, do you think that the Bible are, are letters to Christians? And he said, well, yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, that's what you get for reading somebody else's mail. And he, he didn't like it a whole lot, but you know what? He became one of my favorite professors and I one of his. And all he wanted to do was debate religion with me because the guy was seeking you know, yes. but this movie kind of reminds me a little bit. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard about it. That professor at Florida who made his students write Jesus on a piece of paper and then put it on the floor and stomp on it. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, one more question about the movie. Why, why do you think this movie that your husband's in is important? I'll tell you why. We are lacking a discussion in the United States today because of political correctness. We've been silenced, and we are no longer even having the discussion. And this movie raises that discussion. And it's a very important discussion to have because we are constantly being bombarded with secular messages against a belief in religion. And conversely, we're also being bombarded with messages that promote secularism, this idea of government as God, of Gaia as the ruler of the earth, and the smallness of man. And when you make men feel small, they become small. And I think that uh, you diminish the potential greatness of man. And so for that reason, I would say this film is ultimately very important. And, you know, Sam, what I would add to that is David Kenneman, he's over there and, and he bought the George Barna group and they do all the surveying, especially of millennials. And one of the things that they're saying is that millennials uh, if they're believers and they go off to college, they're not prepared for professors like this and that we're not doing a good job as a believing community and parents and educators to have them prepared with arguments. So when they run into these professors like that or, or some of the other arguments, um, many of which you make in your book, which we'll talk about in a minute, we need to do a better job of educating our children. What Do you agree? Well, here's the thing, Dave. You, you've got... People who go to church go for an hour or an hour and a half every weekend and think that that's going to be enough religious education for their children to get some some foundation in God, and they're completely wrong. They're just it's a misguided notion that you can spend a, an hour and a half of your week on God, if if it's even that, and and come out with a with a firm belief system. You can't, especially when every day in school you're being taught that uh, we're destroying the earth and we are bad people and the earth uh, existed for so, so long before people even came along. Uh, and, and um, I mean, it's, it's a very conflicted message that our kids are getting. And then you try to throw God in there and they just don't know what to do with that, I believe. They, that, that it, they're, we're basically losing them before they even get to college. So when they're, when they're confronted with a professor such as the one that my husband played, They'll just buy, buy along with it. They'll just go right along with it. Okay, let me write down God is dead. I have, no, I have no skin in this game. All I want is an A from this guy. I'll do exactly what he tells me to do. If he wants me to write Jesus on a piece of paper and stomp on it, and, and unfortunately they have an apathy as well. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter. But you know what? These things actually do matter, and we, we ought to be teaching our kids that these things matter, that you stand up for what you believe in. 
and that there is something to believe in, both. One of the surveys found out the average young person in America watches 34 hours a week of television, 30 hours of schoolwork, 10 hours playing video games, 15 hours texting, surfing the Internet, and we have them in the church one or two hours at the most. Exactly. And so this overpowering secular worldview, for one of another term, does that make you feel pessimistic about the direction of America? You know what? I would feel pessimistic, but I keep seeing these little glimmers, these signs mm-hmm. of hope. Uh, the kids who who don't buy into the abortion lie, uh, and kids, kids, the young people who are fed up. And um, I, of course, I because I have my website truefeminist.com, I come into contact with young women who are standing up for themselves and saying, you know what? Don't victimize me. And I love that because they, the kids actually are, are, in a sense, they're smarter than we give them credit for because a lie cannot stand. Right. The lies are tested. The lies that they're being taught in school are also being tested and weighed. And a lot of kids are too smart by, by a mile, and they figure it out, and they go, wait a minute, everything is fair? That's actually a lie. Mm-hmm. You know? So I, I have a good deal of hope, but... Um, By the same token, you know, there's more work to be done. The hope that I have and the optimism that I have is I believe that the American people and the faith-based people in this country will continue to say enough is enough. But that brings me to your book, The Answer, Proof of God in Heaven, with Marius Forte. Did I pronounce his name correctly? Excellent. Okay. You stated on Fox News in an interview about the book that you had been a non-believer, and then you went on a quest. What, what was that quest, Sam? I, ne- I needed to know. I needed answers. So I went on a quest not, not specifically to find God, but I, was just, I just wasn't thrilled with the idea that you live and then you die, and that's the end of it. I needed to know more. So I, so I went on a quest to find uh, a reason for my existence, really. And what I found instead was God. And how did that happen? I mean, what influences do you kind of credit with that? Was it a book, a movie, a friend, an I, advocate? Or? I, well, actually, it was, a, it was a long, drawn-out process, really. I'd known Marius for years. I'd known him to be a Roman Catholic, a firm believer. Businessman. Uh, he used to say he didn't believe in God. He knew God. And that always kind of <laughs> impressed me. Um, but but uh, we weren't even living near each other at that point, and I just decided that I needed to have. I guess I guess perhaps underneath it, I was looking for a little bit of what he had, a little bit of that faith. That um, and also I would say I grew up with great fear, and I needed something to assuage my fear. Was that even because I wouldn't were, have admitted it then? Was that because you were in a Jewish family, or or did that have anything I, to do with it? I am not sure, but I will say I showed my mother, I have a very bony wrist, and I showed it to her one day because one of my bones on my wrist really sticks out. And her answer was, that could be cancer. (laughs) So my point being, I grew up with a lot of fear, just Uh fear of the unknown. Now, that could be because she was an atheist and it just transferred over to me, you know, kind of the way those things do. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I did have a lot of fear, and so I just started looking and I got a lot of books. I, I bought a lot of books. I borrowed books from the library and I would I was constantly I traveled a great deal with the modeling so I was constantly on airplanes and alone in hotel rooms and I had a good deal of time and I just I just went on this quest. I just wanted more answers. And the more answers I got, the more logic I saw in the universe and the more I realized that it couldn't have happened by chance. And that's one of the strong arguments that we make in the book is that chance really doesn't exist. Chance is your point of view. And it's a crutch. It's easier to say, oh, that happened to me by accident, than to admit that you had anything to do with your circumstances and where you find yourself in life. Well, that that goes then to the title of the book, The Answer, Proof of God in Heaven. What is the proof? Uh, So the proof that we go into in the book is all of the immutable laws of the universe that that we know we may not actually be able to articulate them, but we know. We know that for every effect, 
there's been a cause. Cause and effect is one of the intransigent laws of the universe. If you do something, there will be a repercussion. There will be an outcome because of what you've done, um, and and so on and so forth. There's the law of polarity, the law of balance. Uh, there is justice in the universe, even if we can't see it. Um, the idea that time is simply something that exists within our sphere, but not necessarily outside of our sphere. And of course, that leads you the the, the just the the simple the simplicity of the argument of cause and effect. If the universe had a beginning, somebody had to start it. This is Dave Garrison. We're here with actress, author, and talk show host Sam Sorbo, and we'll return after a few important announcements. This is Dave Garrison, the host of the Faith and Liberty Talk Show. And before we get back with this week's guest, I wanted you to know that the Faith and Liberty Talk Show and Young America's Foundation, YAF, will hold a conservative women's conference for women and men on the campus of the Ohio Christian University on April 10th. The conference theme is Restore Our American Heritage and will feature a number of Fox News contributors and political activists, including Star Parker, Kate Obenshane, Chris Ann Hall, Ashley Pratt, and Hadley Heath. As the host of the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, I will be the master of ceremonies. There will be breakout sessions covering the fraud of hope and change, Liberty First, Restore America, how health care reform will affect millennials and the rest of us, and the war on women. For more information, please go to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show website at faithandliberty.org. Again, for more information, please go to the website faithandliberty.org. Hope to see you on April 10th at Ohio Christian University. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show. We hope you are enjoying this week's show. After a short break to hear from our sponsor, Ohio Christian University, we will rejoin our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's guest. Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell are coming to Ohio Christian University Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Get your tickets today at ohiochristian.edu for this riveting event. Tickets are going quickly, so secure yours now at ohiochristian.edu to meet Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell at Ohio Christian University on Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Made possible by Millwood Inc., The Computer Workshop, and Christian Healthcare Ministries. Ohio Christian University is one of the fastest growing universities in the nation, offering undergraduate and graduate degree programs fully online in the areas of business, psychology, chemical dependency counseling, nursing, and ministry. You can earn an accredited, relevant, and affordable online degree all from the comfort of your home. Now is the time to prepare for your future and earn your degree with Ohio Christian University. Call today at 855-OCU-GRAD or online at ocuonline.com. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, where faith and liberty meet. Now, back to the discussion with our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's wonderful guest. This is Dave Garrison, and we return now to our conversation with actress, author, talk show host, and famous mom, Sam Sorbo. Another question that came out of that interview you had on Fox News, you said most people just go through life distracted. Why is this a problem and why a reason for writing your book? It's a problem because they're not living in reality and things are happening around them and they will reap the consequences of those things without even understanding how they came about. You, you, You need to live a purposeful life in order to get the most benefit out of your life. And, and we are distracted. We're distracted by silly news stories. I mean, what's happening in Crimea has has a, a great deal of effect on how we are going to end up in 10 years yes, or five absolutely. years even. But at the same time, the news carried nothing but the Malaysian airliner, for which they had no answers, for which there was very little new uh, information coming, and they virtually ignored what's happening in Crimea. So, uh, you know, the news media is certainly part of the the guilty parties in distracting us. We need to pay attention to what's going on. The reason that I wrote the book is to is to give people an idea of how big their lives really are, how important it is to pay attention. Um, Sam, we'll we will put up anything that we mention as a link uh, on our website, so the listeners, if we mention the book or 
someone we've read or something that's important, we put all those links up there so they can access them. So if there's something that um, uh, we think is real important, I, I want to do that. Great. And now I want to go back to something. And I want to try this on you uh, because I didn't really see it this way in your book. The one example is often used. If you if you walked out in a field and there was an automobile there and you'd walk up to it and you immediately you say, you know, somebody made that car. Somebody put that car there. Mm -hmm. But yet the secular argument for evolution um, and spontaneous uh, creation, they don't see it that way. We interviewed Dr. Ben Carson, and when I used that example, he said, you should look in the human brain or the human eye, and anybody who's ever in, in his business as a neurosurgeon, he said, there is no possible way you could look at that and not realize there is a creator. So how does science and religion, how are they complementary to you? Hmm. Okay, so Einstein said that science without religion is, uh, let's see, blind, but religion without science is lame, something like that. Y yes, he um, did. <laughs> um, Einstein, the, one of the greatest scientists that, that we've known, believed very much in God because he understood that when you have a complicated structure, it doesn't just happen by accident. Accident, if, if accidents did anything, the NASA, when we were still, uh, had a, had a space program, would have said, oh, you know what, this, this thing on the satellite's not working. Let's go to bed, and hopefully in the morning, chance will have fixed it. <laughs> and no one has ever said that. Right. Right. So it's not even somebody made the car. It's you're you're going to concede right away that somebody drove the car there. Right. I mean, yeah, I make this argument in my book. You know, there was a vacant lot next to my house uh, for many years. And then we went out of town because we lived up in Vancouver when Kevin was shooting up there. And we came back uh, eight months later. And all of a sudden there was a structure there. And, you know, I said, wow, that's amazing. A structure just appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> And somebody said, well, there, there was an architect and there was a builder. And I said, well, I never saw an architect or a builder, so I don't believe in them. It's the most absurd argument. It is, it is an entirely absurd argument. It is based almost entirely on ego. That's what's, that's what's scary about it. Uh, Marius Forte, the, your co-author, says the book is not Christian on that same interview. Right. What did he mean or what do you mean? I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that, because it deals with Christianity, but it's not a Christian book, per se. Yes, because you're using the proofs, and the proofs lead you to Christ. That's it, it, yeah, it's the reverse. It, it, Christian book says, look at the Bible, the Bible's true. If you read the Bible, it tells this story, so you have to believe the story, and therefore you understand that Christianity is the way to go, or, you know, it, 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 for the New Testament in any case. We go from the other, we go from the scientific, the metaphysical sort of elements, and when you start, when you start delving into that, we prove the existence of God. If God, then, if God, then what? Then you can go to the Bible, and you have these historical documents that have been absolutely verified countless numbers of times, and believe right. me, if they could disprove the Bible, they would have done it. Yes. Uh, but they you know, keep discovering things that only lend more proof to the stories in the in the Old and the New Testament. Um, and so by that measure, we we look at all of the evidence there, and that brings us to a belief in Christ. Right. And I think, listeners, this is the reason you should buy this book, is because uh, the, the proof, and Mar Marius and Sam went into all these proofs and logic in the science, and the outcome of that is it could only be God, all right? And therefore, Christ must be who he is. So that's why I thought you guys wrote the book, and I, I think you clarified that, and that's great. Yeah. I mean, when, when we were shooting God's Not Dead in Baton Rouge, actually, I misspoke. When we were shooting, Kevin was doing another film with the producers of God's Not Dead, and we were shooting that also in Louisiana, strangely. And um, uh, while we were shooting that, we were talking, I was telling them about this book, and they're like, that's so weird, that's very much like a movie that we're shooting next year sometime. And so it was just kind of an, an interesting tie-in. Uh, look, we were, we were told to be fishers for souls. Uh, that's, that's what we're about. If you, if you 
can come to a belief in God, and God willing, you will, you'll understand personal responsibility in your life, and you will live a much more fulfilled life. Absolutely. If you don't believe there's any reason for you to be here, you will have a much less fulfilled life. The atheist sits in a black, dark room and won't open the curtains and, and correctly says, it is dark in here. But if you just open the curtains, you'll see the light. This is Dave Garrison. We're here with actress, author, and talk show host Sam Sorbo, and we'll return after a few important announcements. This is Dave Garrison, the host of the Faith and Liberty Talk Show. And before we get back with this week's guest, I wanted you to know that the Faith and Liberty Talk Show and Young America's Foundation, YAF, will hold a conservative women's conference for women and men on the campus of the Ohio Christian University on April 10th. The conference theme is Restore Our American Heritage and will feature a number of Fox News contributors and political activists, including Star Parker, Kate Obenshane, Chris Ann Hall, Ashley Pratt, and Hadley Heath. As the host of the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, I will be the master of ceremonies. There will be breakout sessions covering the fraud of hope and change, Liberty First, Restore America, how health care reform will affect millennials and the rest of us, and the war on women. For more information, please go to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show website at faithandliberty.org. Again, for more information, please go to the website faithandliberty.org. Hope to see you on April 10th at Ohio Christian University. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show. We hope you are enjoying this week's show. After a short break to hear from our sponsor, Ohio Christian University, we will rejoin our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's guest. Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell are coming to Ohio Christian University Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Get your tickets today at ohiochristian.edu for this riveting event. Tickets are going quickly, so secure yours now at ohiochristian.edu to meet Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell at Ohio Christian University on Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Made possible by Millwood Inc., The Computer Workshop, and Christian Healthcare Ministries. Ohio Christian University is one of the fastest growing universities in the nation, offering undergraduate and graduate degree programs fully online in the areas of business, psychology, chemical dependency counseling, nursing, and ministry. You can earn an accredited, relevant, and affordable online degree all from the comfort of your home. Now is the time to prepare for your future and earn your degree with Ohio Christian University. Call today at 855-OCU-GRAD or online at ocuonline.com. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, where faith and liberty meet. Now, back to the discussion with our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's wonderful guest. This is Dave Garrison, and we return now to our conversation with actress, author, talk show host, and famous mom, Sam Sorbo. Uh, you've become famous recently for some comments about homeschooling. Uh, what is your your view first of the value of homeschooling? Well, I'm a, I am an advocate of homeschooling. Uh, I have three kids, 12, 10, and 8, who I homeschool, almost 10, I should say. Um, I, the, the school system, the schools are designed to form a wedge between the parent and the child. Now, you have two chances in your life at a parent-child relationship. The first one is when you're the child. The second one is when you're the parent. Uh, I worked very hard to become a parent, and I wouldn't sacrifice that relationship on the altar of anything, really on the altar of anything. So when I figured out that I had the opportunity to homeschool as nervous as I was and as anxious as I was, I decided it would, have been, it would be the best choice for us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, for that reason, and it's been an incredible journey and an incredible growth opportunity. And it saddens me when parents say, I could never homeschool my child. I had a parent call me the other day, and um, she's going through some trouble because her child is not feeling at all nourished in the school and is, is really struggling, such that even the pro-common core, pro-education, uh, vice Super into somebody, somebody high up in the echelon of the school recommended that she take her daughter out of the school, and she started the conversation by saying, "I can't homeschool her," and my heart sank because that is the that is the parent who needs to homeschool. Yes, the parent who feels that their relationship with their child is so broken that they can't even fix it. 
you're the parent who needs to keep your child home and homeschool them. And as we talked, and I and I kind of expounded on the different ways of going about homeschooling, uh, what the children really need to learn and what they're being forced to learn in school are two completely different things. And why we think that the government knows best when it regards our own personal relationship with our child and and the education of our child is beyond me. The government does not know best. This idea, Common Core, let me just say, the government is behind Common Core. It is completely untested. How can they be shoving Common Core down our throats without having any proof, any proof, no proof whatsoever that it has any positive effect? Zero proof. Wow, you're pretty passionate about this subject. I love it. It bothers me because it, people me allow themselves to be led by the nose. The government has put a ring through your nose, and they're being, they're being led by their noses, and they're sacrificing their children on the altar of government. Well, I'm from Texas, and I want to point out right here, Texas has not adopted Common Core, and I don't think they will either. Well, don't be don't be so quick. They had C Scope, which was their own version of Common Core, which I think that they've finally upended and done away with. The problem is, Dave, Common Core is just the name that they've put on the agenda that's been driving our schools for many decades now. The damage is there. Common Core now exists. It's in our textbooks. It's it's already pervaded the culture of our educational institutions. And so now saying, okay, we're not going to sign on, you know, hook, line, and sinker. It's just hook and line, but it's there already. You can call it Common Core, and you can say that we're going to get rid of Common Core, but it's already in the textbook. Now, here, now I have a question for you, because you're at a university. Are you guys looking at SAT scores for your admissions? Uh, we look at SAT, ACT. Okay. The guy who's heading up the college boards now is, is changing the, guy the whole who, thing, yeah design the Common Core standards. So right. the college boards now are going to be aligned with Common Core standards. So if your kids aren't of that mindset, if they can't answer those questions correctly, they're going to score poorly on the SATs. I'd like to see colleges across the country say, you know what, if they're Common Core aligned, we won't accept them. We're not interested in them. Just to clarify for Ohio Christian, we look at students without either ACT or SAT because we have a huge number of uh, homeschoolers uh, matter of right. fact, the producer of the show, Jenna Wood, who's sitting here in the studio right now, was homeschooled. Hi, <laughs> she says hi. And she's actually doing some of the sound engineering today. And she went all the way through my program here, the business program, is now the producer of the show. And mm -hmm. she and I and um, a couple others went down to the National Homeschooling Conference where I spoke because I'm such a big advocate of homeschooling as well, Sam. Uh, we did, we homeschooled our, our children. We pulled them out of public schools. And here's why I pulled them out of public schools. And it was a long time ago. I now also have 17 grandchildren, most wow. of which are being homeschooled. But I, I'm sitting with a superintendent in Pennsylvania, where you're from, and they had homeschooling by law. And I, I, we're talking to the superintendent, and he starts giving us these ridiculous requirements for record keeping and all sorts of stuff. And I told him, no, we're not going to do that. And he said, no, wait a minute, Dave. I want you to understand when those your children get on the bus, they're no longer yours. When they get off the bus, then they're yours again. But the time we have them, you have no say so over it. So here's my question for you, Sam, in that. Do you believe that parents have an unalienable right to homeschool? Absolutely. Well, let me put it this way. I don't believe that the government has a right to dictate. No, I agree. Or at, at any level? At any level. What about in public school? You mean regarding homeschooling? Yeah, well, let, yeah, we were talking about homeschooling, and we're totally yeah. that. What about uh, your uh, rights as a parent if your children go to public school? Well, that's the problem, right? Because now the government, now the government runs the school, and you are giving up your custody of your child, basically, for those hours of the day. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter what the reality is. In reality, they're your kids. You should have absolute say. But they're children, they're malleable, and the government can use them and can use them against you. This is another argument against Common Core. If you'll notice, they're doing assessments. Those are not tests. Right. Assessments are judgment calls regarding your child. A lot of the assessments that they're doing are done on computers, meaning you can't see them as a parent. You won't be allowed to review them. 
and they will be asking the children, do your parents drink? Do they own a gun? Do they ever talk in a loud voice? Do they have arguments? How do they resolve their arguments? Does your dad ever sleep on the couch? I don't know what they're going to ask the kids. <laughs> right. They, the mischievous minds come up with much more than my mind can about different ways of getting inside your house. And then pretty soon, they've got you where they want you. All right, so that begs the question, do you think public schools are redeemable? Oh. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, think, I, I, asked, Star, pa- I asked Star Parker that question. And, yeah. and Star and Kate Obenshane and several others are going to be at Ohio Christian here on April 10th. We have a conservative women's conference, and I brought these people in. And when I asked Star Parker, she says, no, they're not redeemable because of their worldview and their perspective. And all Christians should pull all their kids out of public school. Well, for a lot of people, that's not practical because they're working parents. What do you, and, how do, and their hours have just just been cut to 29 hours a week because of Obamacare. <laughs> you are great, Sam. I love it. Uh, let me ask you another question that's kind of in the same vein, but it, it's something that I think is real interesting because my daughter, with her eight children, um, she's trying to give a run the Duggars a run for their money. Yeah. But she's gone to the classical homeschooling education. Aren't you doing something similarly? I do classical conservative, uh, cl- uh, what's it called? Classical Christian curricula. Right, which is getting back to more of the education that was done 50, 100, 150 years ago, where the stu- students are, one of the main goals is to teach them to think. Yeah, to teach them to think for themselves. Also, to teach them to teach themselves. Right. To teach them to teach themselves. So they are lifelong learners and they are unafraid to learn anything. We have a whole multiple generations now that are afraid to think for themselves. What do you think about the situation in Crimea? I don't know, but grapes are only, you know, 79 cents a pound today. Uh, You know, we need thinking people. So, yeah, and I and I love the classical method. And I love the fact Mm -hmm. that just recently, I think it was Arnie Coleman, but I'm I'm not sure, said he's not sure why we have he's not sure why we have kids memorized there's really no reason to do all that rote memorization, which is anathema to the classical model, which is that children, young children, and we all know this, so don't even argue with me, they love to memorize. They will memorize TV commercials. They'll memorize billboards. They will memorize anything they can get their hands on because they are, they are programmed to do that. And they remember everything we've ever told them, I think. <laughs> That's right. And they'll memorize all the nasty words that have ever come out of your mouth faster yeah. than you can say them. Uh, almost. So, so the idea with the classical model is kids, kids do a lot of memorization. They enjoy it. And wouldn't you know, it serves them later on in life. Well, that goes back to, and my undergraduate degree was pre-law, and that meant I had a major of history and a major of political science at the University of Pittsburgh. Ultimately, I got a law degree, and I'm still a licensed attorney. But the students, and I'm, I'm going to be a little bit careful because I don't want it to sound too overreaching here, but I will, and a lot of the other professors will say, the homeschool kids that come to our university are some of the best students we see. And it's because of what you just said, and as a mother you're doing, which I highly commend you, these homeschoolers know how to think, they know how to study, they know how to reason. Now, I give freshmen and sophomores the immigration exam and to see if they could become a U.S. citizen. Now they've finished 12, 13 years of public school. Less than 25% can pass the immigration exam. By the way, we post that immigration exam on our website, and anybody can go there, take it, and and get a score. So if if you or anybody else is interested, by the time they leave here, over 90% can pass, which hopefully that indicates we're doing something. But the education that we see coming in the university is really a shame. But well, let me let, let me just address that quickly because we are not in our school systems teaching our children the value of what it is to be an American citizen, how valuable that is, and yet the lie is that it has no value, and that's why we should just make everybody legal. But the truth that everybody can see is that it has intense value because people risk their lives to get here. Right, right. And I think that kids 
they understand that there's a lie being uh, promulgated on them. They just don't know really what to do about it because they're not given the tools. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that they don't know how they they and, and they won't have a value of being an American. Do we not value our country, or are we just going to give it away like they just gave away the internet? I don't know. Boy, you bring up some great subjects. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Hollywood with you for just a minute. Uh, as an actor, you've been on lots of TV shows and movies. And do you think there is a prejudice against actors who are Christian in Hollywood? Okay, I was not a Christian actor, really. Uh, I became a Christian a little bit later, so it's difficult for me to speak to that. There is definitely prejudice in Hollywood uh, against uh, against a number of things. Uh, there definitely is. Uh, and that's why to, to say that there's no prejudice is a misnomer. Prejudice is everywhere. Discrimination is everywhere. And frankly, this idea that we shouldn't discriminate is absurd. We discriminate every day. I decided whether to take your call or not. That was discrimination. <laughs> I'm glad that you took it. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, were, you fared well in that discriminating choice there that I go. made. Uh, and so did I, actually. So it worked out well. It's hard for me to address those questions. My husband, on the other hand, has recently been quite vocal about his beliefs. And uh, we're pretty sure that he is suffering consequences associated with those. Well, and we've heard that from other actors who are faith-based. Are there people in Hollywood who you admire for their faith and their views? Uh, yes. Patricia Heaton comes to mind. Yes, of course. I, I've seen her on Thou Shalt Laugh. You can get the video on Netflix if you've seen her on there. And um, she talks about her faith in that, that video. She's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing is that it's easy for me to separate the beliefs, uh, the actions, the person. I, uh, if somebody, and, and there are a lot of people who don't, they're not lockstep with my beliefs. Right. But I can, I can um, commend them for the beliefs with which I agree, and I can forgive them for the beliefs with which I disagree uh, and move on. The problem is that a lot of people in Hollywood are very emotionally based, and they can't take a logical point of they can't take a logical point of view at those things. And so, if you're not in lockstep with them, if you disagree on one point, you're just they cut you out. You're out of the picture. Well, I'll I'll step out and say they're hypocritical. Uh, Jason Matera, I don't know if you're familiar with his book, Hollywood Hypocrites, where he I'm, go I'm, go ahead, Sam. I'm not familiar with his book. I'm more familiar with Ben Shapiro's book, Bullies. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's and, a similar thing. And that's the other thing. But what um, Jason Matera has done, he's known as the ambush videographer, and he's the one right. that goes up to uh, various political officials and gets them angry and upset with his questions. But one of the things he points out is you'll have people like Leonardo DiCaprio that's so um, left and so into their the, the things that they stand for, yet he's bought all this land in the Northeast and now claims he is a honeybee farmer uh, in order to get all these tax exemptions. Then, Right. He's pro-taxes, but he's not against saving taxes for himself. Exactly. That's where the hypocrisy comes in. And we see this a lot, well, in lots of different industries, but in Hollywood particularly. And I'm, I'm going to ask this question, and you may not know the answer, but what is the thinking that makes Hollywood so left? That is a very good question. Uh, are there are a couple different theories. I think there are a couple different things at play. One is it's easy money, and every time you have easy money, you have guilt associated with it. So it's a guilt trip. That's what uh, I've heard. And they, what's that? That's what I've heard Yeah, is the logic. They feel guilty. Yeah. Wow. yeah. The other thing is that there was uh, an intent to infiltrate the art. And as we know, artists are a little bit more sort of freewheeling, uh, not very consequential with their thought process. They're more emotional. And, you know, I, I mean, I had a guy on the radio the other day, and he said, he said I said, is health care a right? And he, he oofed and odd a bit and sort of tried to figure it out, which is odd to me because he was calling about Obamacare, and it hadn't occurred to him to c consider whether health care was a right, which is very <laughs> frustrating for me because that's been my objection to Obamacare from the get-go. And he said health care is a right. Wouldn't you agree? And I said, absolutely not. It is not a right. And I let that sit for a minute. And I said, if health care is a right, 
how do you go about exercising that right? You must enslave somebody in order to exercise your right to health care. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, he's arguing that, but what about pre-existing conditions? Don't you feel bad for those people? I can feel bad for those people without enslaving other people to take care of those people. Right. Is the system right. broken? Does it need to be fixed? Yeah, but, but that doesn't mean we just do what we just do anything. We don't run around the room screaming with our hands in the air saying, it's broken, it's broken, let's do anything to fix it. It's like if the house is on fire, I don't shout, paint the living room, because that will not address the problem of the house being on fire. Obamacare will do nothing to address the issues for which it was created. And that's where the logic comes in. We have to have people who have a logical mindset who work through who don't say oh my gosh people with pre-existing conditions let's enslave the entire population and then they still won't have health care and that's how it's going to work out because they haven't thought it through they didn't even read the bill before they passed it right this is dave garrison we're here with actress author and talk show host sam sorbo and we'll return after a few important announcements this is dave garrison the host of the faith and liberty talk show And before we get back with this week's guest, I wanted you to know that the Faith and Liberty Talk Show and Young America's Foundation, YAF, will hold a conservative women's conference for women and men on the campus of the Ohio Christian University on April 10th. The conference theme is Restore Our American Heritage and will feature a number of Fox News contributors and political activists, including Star Parker, Kate Obenshane, Chris Ann Hall, Ashley Pratt, and Hadley Heath. As the host of the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, I will be the master of ceremonies. There will be breakout sessions covering the fraud of hope and change, Liberty First, Restore America, how healthcare reform will affect millennials and the rest of us, and the war on women. For more information, please go to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show website at faithandliberty.org. Again, for more information, please go to the website faithandliberty.org. Hope to see you on April 10th at Ohio Christian University. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show. We hope you are enjoying this week's show. After a short break to hear from our sponsor, Ohio Christian University, we will rejoin our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's guest. Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell are coming to Ohio Christian University Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Get your tickets today at ohiochristian.edu for this riveting event. Tickets are going quickly, so secure yours now at ohiochristian.edu to meet Senator Rick Santorum, Dr. Ben Carson, and Dr. John Maxwell at Ohio Christian University on Monday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Made possible by Millwood Inc., The Computer Workshop, and Christian Healthcare Ministries. Ohio Christian University is one of the fastest growing universities in the nation, offering undergraduate and graduate degree programs fully online in the areas of business, psychology, chemical dependency counseling, nursing, and ministry. You can earn an accredited, relevant, and affordable online degree all from the comfort of your home. Now is the time to prepare for your future and earn your degree with Ohio Christian University. Call today at 855-OCU-GRAD or online at ocuonline.com. You are listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show, where faith and liberty meet. Now, back to the discussion with our host, Dave Garrison, and this week's wonderful guest. This is Dave Garrison, and we return now to our conversation with actress, author, talk show host, and famous mom, Sam Sorbo. Now, I'm interviewing soon-to-be, I believe, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska, and he is a big anti-Obamacare uh, candidate, but he was in D.C. and a policy writer and all sorts of things. And we're going to get a lot into that. But just for the sake of this conversation, having worked as an executive in a, one of the, if not the largest healthcare company in America, I can yep. tell you what's wrong and I can tell you how easily it can be fixed. And I'm telling you it could be fixed in three months. And, okay, tell me how. All right, number one is, and you've heard this before, sell it across um, state lines. And to do that, we need what's called a national charter. Banking has a national charter. That's how banking works all across the country and actually the world. So as long as you can buy stuff across uh, state lines, it has to be converted into everybody's health insurance as a personal insurance. 
when I first got to this major insurance company and helping kind of do a turnaround for the company because they were going south, I said to the CEO and a couple of the others, I said, what are you most afraid of for our business for the future? And they said that individuals will be able to buy health care like they buy auto insurance. As soon as the consumer gets personal control of their own health care, we're out of business. A doctor who is the president of the Association of Physicians and Surgeons in America, Dr. Juliet Madrigal, it's one of our very first shows on our, our webpage, she said for cash, she can buy a blood panel test for 15 bucks. But if her patient uses insurance, it's two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. So, so we have all of this this monopoly going on. Uh, since I've got you, what what do you think of the Hobby Lobby situation? Well, I read the I read the report of the uh, the hearing yesterday, and it's fascinating. They seem to be tying themselves in knots in order to uh, uh, justify their attempt to make Hobby Lobby submit. It also seems like the justices are actually questioning their ability to do that. But then again, you know, they told us it wasn't a tax, and then they went to the Supreme Court and argued that it was a tax, and the Supreme yeah. Court bent over backwards in order to create it, the paperwork to say that it was a tax. So, I, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm standing for Hobby Lobby. I, I really I hope that they pull through. Um, it's one more chink in the armor. But, but between you and me, I don't think that Obamacare is going to stand. Well, I hope you're absolutely right. Now, the Western European example is uh, kind of scary because some of that stuff, unfortunately, moves here. And uh, back to homeschooling for just a second, because I think that fits in. Are you familiar with the Romica family out of Germany that came sure. here? And, yeah. and what are your thoughts on them? Because I think this well, could I'll have an you, analogy. It was, it was very frustrating. We're, we're going to expend hard-earned tax dollars to evict a family who is here uh, under duress. Let's just say they're under duress, but they, but they produce. They're members of society. We're going to spend our tax dollars fighting them in court for, for years, and then when it's finally ruled that they may not stay, uh, uh, what is it, I, 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 uh, ICS calls them and says, you know, we're not going to deport you. We're just going to give you a pass for now. Right. Can they not get on the same page? Is our government so corrupt and so weighed down with bureaucracy that they can't get on the same page? Uh, that was a public relations thing. But if you think about Germany and the courts, when they, I read the entire opinion, every word of the appeals court, they basically said the Romicas were not being persecuted, yet yeah. they were going to be fined $9,000 a week, a month, or something like that. They were threatened to be put in jail and their children, and it was, they were threatened to have their children taken away from them. But our U.S. appeals court said they were not being persecuted. And so, therefore, they didn't qualify for asylum. It was one of the most ludicrous decisions I've ever seen. Well, we're yeah. getting a little short of time, but I, I do want to ask you uh, a couple quick things before we, we stop. I just saw you in Storm Rider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you already started giggling. And your role as a mother, how does that feel to act in a role that's so 180 degrees different than who you are? Yeah. <laughs> it was very freeing. Oh, was it? <laughs> half, the lines, half of the nasty lines I came up with myself. Oh, you did? Oh, they're great. I mean, throw your kid out, say, here, you stay with your uncle, and uh, I'm out of here, man. Turn around and spin yeah. out with your, your Lexus. Most of us, we can't act, and so I really appreciate it because you sold it, girl. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I got, I got some emails on that. Oh, you, you did. Know. I'm glad I know you were acting because, yeah, it yeah, was well, fun. Well, that's when an actor is good, isn't it, is when you sell it like that? Yeah. Yeah. But here's yeah. The, the closing question. There are a number of film companies out there like Rick Santorum's Echo Light uh, and yeah. a few others, Kirk Cameron and uh, several. Uh, trying to produce faith-based film, what, what, what do you think their chances of success are? Generally, I think that there's an appetite for faith-based films, and uh, Hollywood is discovering that. And not just Hollywood, but, but uh, companies outside of Hollywood, like Pure Flix that did God's Not Dead. Right. Uh, God's Not Dead is showing incredible profit margins. Once, once they are convinced that it is a profitable endeavor, uh, Hollywood and these other companies have a great chance of 
of becoming successful. Uh, Hollywood, of course, right after um, what was the faith, the Sandra Bullock faith based movie that wasn't really faith based, but you know they 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 said that it was right after the Passion where, of Christ. They, where the football they, uh, players came out with in their house. sort of faith based divisions. Um, blind side. Trying, the blind side. They're trying to they're trying to get that stuff done. They don't really have a good concept in Hollywood right now, but that's just because the the cream hasn't risen to the top yet for people who understand faith-based uh, movie making. For instance, Soul Surfer that my husband was in, um, right. he played the guy who saves Bethany. Right. The, the actual story is when they were loading her up into the ambulance that the, am, that the paramedic asked her, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And she answered yes. They wouldn't allow that to be in the movie hmm. because they don't understand. They see Jesus as this controversial figure, and so they they don't like the words Jesus and Christ and th- that kind of thing, except to swear words. In movies today, it's sort of the unspoken theme, if you will. Uh, you'll you'll hear when you hear hymns being sung in a church scene, it won't be hymns about the sun. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and I and I personally I think that that's a shame. Uh, but they may come around. We'll see. Hollywood started out as an extraordinarily conservative industry. It is not that anymore. It could come back. We'll see. Well, Sam, I think you've made some fantastic points, and you're very passionate. You may have been the most passionate guest I've had uh, in two <laughs> years, and I really oh. appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I know you've done some guests uh, on Andrea. Well, it was the Andrea Tantera show. It's now the Sam Sorbo show. Right. Weekdays. Right. Nine to noon Eastern time. All right. So let me start that over. You've taken over the talk show for from Andrea from the the five at five. Um, how is that going now as a talk show host? It's great. It's uh, it's a lot of fun for me. I broadcast from nine to noon weekdays uh, Eastern time, which means I get up quite early on the West Coast. 6 to 9 a.m., and um, but it's great, and it's the best commute in the world because uh, I do it at home. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. Well, Which allows me to stay home with my kids, which I really appreciate. Well, we thank you so much for your stand, your views, and your willingness to be on the show. Uh, I know that there are people here at Ohio Christian who have taken note of you, and uh, you know your husband's going to have to watch out because I think you're, you may end up a bigger... Uh, draw than he is, but we'll see. Oh, I doubt that very much. <laughs> yeah, he's a great actor. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. On behalf of our host, Dave Garrison, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Faith and Liberty Talk Show today. For additional information about the show, please go to faithandliberty.org where you can access previous shows, like us on our Faith and Liberty Facebook page, and access other resources. Please keep in mind that the Faith and Liberty Talk Show exists only with the generosity and support of our listeners. If the show is of value to you, we would appreciate you visiting our website, faithandliberty.org, and donating to the show. The opinions and comments represent the views of our speakers and may or may not represent the views of Ohio Christian University. May God bless you and thank you for listening to our show.